We are doing a response video, that's right, to DBK's uh, Five Knife Lies. They had a really good video last Thursday uh, where they said five things that, uh, that they don't believe to be true or that they could comment on that are perhaps sort of common adages even, things that you hear recited over and over again uh, by people who may not be informed or by people who may have an older viewpoint that's not quite up with the times. Tell I view some of these knife lies. Anyway, it's all a bit uh, hyperbolic, perhaps, to call them knife lies because, you know, it gets the clicks. And I know you need to get the clicks. How else is Martin going to get everyone to come and behold his fucking glorious woolen sweater? Look at that. That is rugged and warm and it softens a hard man. Anyway, sharpness is important was lie number one. Then was military knives are all good was lie number two. Soft knives all being bad was knife lie number three. And then carbon being better than stainless in terms of general steel, a general steel comment. I see that one fairly often. And then Chinese knives are bad was the last knife lie. So let's break down these knife lies and uh, in a uh, high tech channel here. And uh, we're gonna say what I think of each of the, the knife lies. So the first knife lie about sharpness being important it's had hyperbolic to say that sharpness is important is a lie, but what the comment they were really making was that it's geometry that cuts the most. And I 100% agree. This Buck 119, this knife here has a really nice acute hollow grind. This knife with a dull edge would push through a block of cheese, for example, a lot easier even than, say, this TRC Apocalypse with a very, very sharp hair shaving edge. The geometry of this thin hollow grind is going to be what cuts as long as the knife uh, type style is suited to a, a hollow grind, a thinner grind that is going to push, cut, slice a lot easier. For a survival knife, you want the thick. You want the thick with a nice sharp edge. You're going to have to keep that sharp edge, you know, keep that apex honed in. But yes, absolutely blade geometries like this, and this is a pretty, pretty basic, uh, you know, hollow grind. Uh, blade geometries like on even this Hogue, uh, Alicia Witt's, uh, it's very thin, you know, thin knife here. This is going to cut a lot easier, even when dull, even when that edge, you know, I can, when I can run my finger along that edge and not cut myself, couldn't do it now. A bit of a tap even gets a bit of a sting going. But that thin geometry, that thin blade, that is, yeah, absolutely going to be as important as a nicely honed mirror polished apex. So yes, tick to point one. I will give that my seal of approval that yes, uh, geometry is indeed what cuts, and sharpness is perhaps, that's what gets your foot in the door, that's what gets the knife moving, absolutely, and it's what you try and maintain, but a really nice sharp edge on a fat, or a thick, or a poorly done grind, I always used to find this in the old zero tolerance knives, just didn't like how they cut, had good steels, you get them really sharp out of the box, but the edges just didn't last to me, those thick edges, they just, you know, this here, this right at the tip here, oh, 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 oh you know, but it very easily becomes this, Whereas if you have a tip that's this at the end of a nice hollow edge, yeah, even once this is kind of rolled over, you can push the rest of this through the material. I feel like when you're a kid and you make the vagina, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, second lie, military knives are good. Yeah, that's a lie. Uh, military knives, I'm not from the military, despite lots of people speculating, I'm not from the, why would you think I'm, look at me, I'm not from the military. But yeah, folks are not in the military, Chances are, if it's issued by them, by the official, you know, quartermaster of the military, that's going to be the thing that they replace first and get their own thing of. So yeah, a common story here in Australia is the Ibison Sheffield pocket knife is issued to a lot of guys uh, at uh, basic training and, you know, in the basic army. And it's a really, really old fashioned, really tacky, you know, stylish, I, I guess it's got a certain charm to it, but they all get that. And the first thing they obviously do is go and get themselves anything else. And that goes for also your fixed blades, you know, the K-Bar is a historically classic knife, but if you want to have something that's going to be a hard-wearing, dual survival knife nowadays, there's been about 40 years of solid iterational improvement over those things. What I find the funniest about military knives equals good is this weird thing that people do, which I guess does sell. It's this like, I'm a designer, I'm going to pick some random like frogmen from the, the West Burmese, you know, Rear Admiral's Navy's, you know, star division. It'll be like this team of 16 guys. 
I'm going to read up about them. I'm going to decide in my head some knife that would suit them. And then I'm going to say, in my all my knife literature, I'm going to say, this knife was designed for the South Burmese frogmen's, you know, expeditions into... Meanwhile, the South Burmese frogmen are like... I don't even know who you are. That, that's what strikes me as the funniest current sort of military-ish trend. All these like really earnest, really like patriotic dudes, you know, I designed this now for the troops and the troops have fucking never heard of it because it's like, they just, it's kind of a bit of a live action role playing but for knife makers and that's the thing that I find the funniest. Always learn to say, oh, I designed this knife, this knife's designed for this military unit. First thing you should ask him is, please send me a photo of the military unit in their grip shot with them shoved in their load bearing vest, then I'll believe you. Because <laughs> otherwise, all you've really done is, hey, I've designed this knife for Buzz Lightyear. Because <laughs> Buzz Lightyear would really appreciate this, would match his armor, and when he goes into space, that's basically what you're doing. So that's the funniest little military thing that I think about knives that you see all the bloody time. This knife designed for this crack unit of this specific, you know, hi hyper tough army thing. You know, they wrote to me and asked me, it's like, I don't know, prove it. <laughs> I just never believe it. So that's the funny military thing that I, I always jumps into my head. Soft knives are bad. Yeah, I can see the merits of a soft knife. If I was going to go on like alone or something, I'd probably bring my SE5 or my SE4 versus my, my TRC Apocalypse. Unless I'm also bringing a, a decent diamond plate sharpener or something, I can absolutely see the point of a soft knife. Something that you want to really survive the test of time with minimal, minimal good tools. I don't think I'd be able to keep this guy very sharp without a sharpener in the field because I'm not that good at sharpening on like the side of a rock or like a pig's butt or whatever it is they do. You know, I'd, it's not my skill set at all. So I can absolutely see why a softer knife is good from that very basic sense of knife maintenance. Hey, don't want to be an Uncle Randy here. But a lot of guys still choose to get the Buck 110 in 420HC so they can sharpen on the bottom of a coffee mug. When they're out camping in the field, they can get their enamel wear out and they can, you know, and they probably just do it to look cool in front of their, their grandchildren. But, you know, still it's part of the knife experience. That soft steel, it has a place, it has a purpose. All that's wasted, right, is when you get really, really high-end steel and you don't heat treat it right and you sell that as soft. When you get your 58, you know, Magna Cuts, or, you know, your, your S110V at 59, you know, wasted S110V. If you want to put a soft steel in a blade to make it malleable and make it easy to deal with, then use like a lower, use S35VN or something like that. That's the only thing that really kind of, where it's actually a, a knife issue, I think, is when you waste the steel's potential. But you know what, anything under S35VN, serve it how you want it. Just be able to explain why, I suppose. Um, yeah, I think everyone has a preferred, you know, heat treatment or preferred hardness of everything. But uh, unless it's crazy, I think it's, you know, all par for the course, really. As long as it's done with a rationale and not just done as in a, oh, we accidentally fucked off this batch of knives. Let's just say it's for, for ductility, this, you know, this 3V that's at, that's at 54. You don't need to sell 3V at 54 Rockwell to be, for it to be a tough steel, you know. You sell 3V at 60 and it's absolutely fine for most people. Anyway, without getting too you know, numerological. That's about how I sit with that one there too. Carbon steels are better than stainless steels. This is something that like, if you dug up my grandpa, brought him back to life, he'd say, carbon steel is the better one, isn't it? Because a long time ago, it absolutely was. Carbon steels for a long time, you really had to choose between edge retention and stainlessness. And those were the two choices. Before you even started thinking of toughness, that was your two choices for like your old man nights, you know? Oh, you want your case in chrome vanadium or your case in true sharp? You know, the chrome vanadium would hold edge for a little bit longer and the true sharp will be stainless. And, you know, most knife guys want the edge to be really keen and sharp and they don't mind if it gets a bit of a tarnish or a bit of a story on that blade face. So that's where the, the lie, I guess, originated from. It's just really out of date now. It's absolutely out of date. The best steels in the world are pretty much unanimously stainless steels in terms of hitting all of those benchmarks. My favorite steels... On the other hand, yeah, for sure. My favorite steel is probably K390 here, even still. Not a stainless steel. I just personally like how it sharpens up. I like the kind of edges I can get on it. I like how it works in the field. It's relatively tough, relatively good at everything that I want it to do. But if you're talking about, you know, overall just best, yeah, absolutely. Maxima. Magnacut dick. LMAX, M390s, they're all, they're, they're marvels of chemistry. They really are. You know, your crew wears, your K390s, your M4s, all great as well, but I think if you're talking about unanimously just 
on the paper, mathematically speaking, the best stills, yeah, they probably all are stainless at this stage. So yeah, I'm cool with saying that that's a bit of a knife lie these days. Now, last thing is Chinese knives are all bad. I don't think we all say that anymore. No one, everyone knows that the Chinese knives are all very well assembled, or like the big companies are all very well assembled. So I don't think the argument now is that they're bad because of the knives coming from China are bad. That's been a long time since that was the case. I mean, the American companies that use Chinese OEMs often choose the bad Chinese OEMs, like companies like Gerber and sometimes CRKT, and knives that keep coming with the really low end materials and the sometimes slightly rough fit and finish. But the main Chinese brands that sell as Chinese brands, your best techs, your Wee Knives, your Civivis, your Rayats, I, I mean, you can't say that they're bad anymore. Like it's just been so, they're, they're mechanically as good, if not better than anything the Europeans or the Americans, the Italians or the Japanese are making, absolutely. What it's about now is identity. And I think what the American knife industry did for so long was rather than investing in innovation, they really hitched themselves to that patriotic identity and that doesn't really make your knives get much better so they kind of treaded water on making their knives and making their brands kind of thing you know down home honky tonk good time you know remember you used to go hunting with your grandpa and, and they sort of really pushed a lot of their efforts into into that and into making these old kind of throwback designs and and bringing them to the new age so it, they just focused on a different thing that they thought would appeal to people Hey, this is Benchmate here. Do you remember going hunting with your uncle in those glorious days between autumn and summer, just in those glimpses of time where it's just you and him and his knife? Well, we've made like a new knife that looks a lot like your uncle's knife, but it costs you like eight times more. And if you don't like that, well, fuck you. And if you make any handles for it, we'll sue you. Zero tolerance, American made knives. This knife looks like a K bar. The K bars won the war. We won the war. We killed everyone. We won the war. K-Bar. This is a folding K-Bar. If you don't like it, fuck you. $1,000. Fuck you. Greg Medford. Greg Medford make K-Bar. Greg Medford. Greg Medford make K-Bar. Gerber make Moji Tool in Toilet Factory. And yeah, absolutely it did. But then the Chinese companies all were like, hey, let's talk to the real fucking nerds and see what they want. The only company that I don't think really does this and does this a bit more from America is Spyderco. I think Spyderco, they talk to us nerds a whole bunch. And so that's why you get the crazy steals, the crazy new designs and the crazy grinds and stuff from Spyderco and the collaborations and whatnot. But I think largely it is a bit of a, it's a socio-political thing. It's like the whole, I don't want to support Chinese manufacturer or, you know, China bad, there's in the country bad. The manufacturing thing, well, that's a tough one for me because I know for a fact that Amazon, a very American company, like puts cameras in their truck drivers' fucking rear view mirrors and times how many, counts how many times they yawn and shit. That's not very nice either. You know, it's like we got to be careful where we're throwing the stones from, you know, for in terms of like the labor market. And unless someone's actually going to show me that we has a factory staffed with children, I'm sort of not, I don't quite think it's as crazy as people say. And, I, you know, it's really easy for people to get super angry about these sorts of things, but it's kind of just amusing for me from a country that basically has a service economy now. We don't really make stuff anymore on a large scale at all. So, you know, we just sell everyone our own, we just sell everyone our materials to make stuff with. You know, we're like, we're the, we're the world's lithium and coal factory, coal mine, and it's, you know, take it all from us and make things and sell them back to us. I've got my own thoughts, obviously. But yeah, the whole, the, the nationalism impregnated into the knife world, I just think it's a bit funny and I'm, I'm bemused by it all and by people who get really angry at, you know, support China, China bad, or like I only buy America, America good. It's like, I don't know, we've, you hear about the knife stores that pay their workers fucking nothing and have huge turnovers of staff and you hear about, yeah, to the delivery, you hear everywhere. It's like the whole workforce globally is tainted by asshole companies treating their workers like assholes. I mean, I'm happy to say, if someone will show me a Chinese knife factory where the fucking people are, you know, jump off the roof because they're so fucking depressed, then absolutely I'll firm up my opinion on this. But I know people say that some labor in China is bad, but I don't, I'm not sure if that means that knife labor in China bad, so to speak, as well. And then I guess there's this whole, are we in a cold war with China at the moment? I don't know. I don't think they'd be selling us so much shit if we actually were. But there's that whole thing as well. And I think all of that is where the China bad still comes from. So 
I'm not a big four dimensional thinker. I don't fucking have, the, I don't talk a great deal about this stuff because frankly, I don't know that much about this stuff. All I will say is that the quality coming from China is generally pretty good for the Chinese companies. And it's, it's in fact, the dumb, dumb US companies trying to make a quick buck and use the cheapest, trashest Chinese OEMs. They're the ones that are keeping the China bad thing going. So I don't know, whose fault is it really? Is it the end stage of capitalism that we start to outsource all of our labor to make the absolute most for the shareholders that we have awful knives coming over with our brand name on them? I don't know, I'm just, you know, I'm just spitballing here. So these are the kind of questions and bold statements that get the China bad thing remaining as a potent argument. But that's about all I'll say about it because frankly, I don't know much more about it. And I try, I try so hard. I'm not always successful, but I try so hard to not talk about shit that I don't really know about. And if I do talk about shit, I like to, I like to at least think that I've, I like to be able to go down and listen to my head of things that I've like read or things that are not even read because you can fucking read anything that you want to justify the way you already think. Things I've actually done, things that I've tested to make me feel a certain way. And I think I'd need to read, know a lot more. I'd need some primary evidence to really make much more of a decision about whether China truly is bad. Anyway, that's my thoughts on DBK's video. The main thing to take away from that video, I think, is that Martin wears a fucking woolen sweater like a prince. Who's that girl running?